welcome everybody. Welcome to Stanford. I tell you, this was the best five years of my life when I was studying here. So I, uh, I'm really excited for you all. You're at the beginning of that journey. Uh, so we're, we're in a really interesting time, right? This, this energy transition. I mean, I think energy has been in transition its entire um, path. But, you know, renewables are really sexy right now, right? I bet a lot of you are really interested in working on, on renewables. And my goal today is to convince you uh, that natural gas has got some sex appeal too. And, um, and, and if there's one thing I want you all to, to take away, it's that when we're thinking about energy, all types of energy have a role to play. And we don't want to let perfect, right, striving for a totally uh, green, clean, energy mix is what we're all after ultimately. But we don't want to let perfect be the enemy of the good. So if we can do something in the near term that is good, we shouldn't um, you know, ignore that because it's not perfect. So, um, so these are my, my three um, takeaways that I actually put down on paper. So we're in an era of decarbonization, right? Especially in the United States, that's what we're all here. We want to solve this problem. And in, in my mind, these are the three key points regarding gas, right? So unless you've had a head under a rock, which I guess you haven't because you got into Stanford, um, you'll know that we have this abundance of natural gas, right? So in the last 10 years, we've discovered this way to untap natural gas from shales and we have this resource that we didn't know we had, right? We all thought that gas was on its way out. And suddenly, the United States in particular goes from being a net importer of gas to a net exporter. And this abundance of gas has uh, some, some real opportunity for decarbonization that I'm going to talk about. The second part is, I think in the US, we think a lot about the US. But there's a big wide world out there, and there's a lot of people without any energy. And natural gas has a real role to play in that. And the third part is we all recognize the need to reduce carbon dioxide. And the oil and gas industry have to be part of that conversation. And I think right now it's really polarized. The energy communities are very polarized. And I think that. Initiatives like the Natural Gas Initiative um, are working to bring communities together because the oil and gas industry has a lot of uh, technology and money uh, that can help solve this problem. So I'm going to touch on each of these, and then I'm going to kind of outline uh, what research we're doing within the Natural Gas Initiative on this. OK, so just to set the stage, right? we've had this huge uptick in uh, both gas production on the right in the US and um, oil production. And if I was to ask you, you know, we've got this big increase in the production of fossil fuels, what has that done for carbon emissions in the United States? Way more, way more fossil fuels than we had before. What's it done? Yeah, why? They already told you. They already told you the answer. They blew my punchline. OK, so yeah. So natural gas has, uh, I guess the pointer doesn't work. Um, natural gas production has gone up in the last 10 years. And with that, we've seen this huge decline in uh, carbon dioxide because coal has been displaced. But these uh, unconventional fields, right? So we're talking about this huge volume of natural gas. And one of the big issues is that we're terrible at getting it out of the ground, right? So typically, for those of you that are not familiar with oil and gas reservoirs, a gas reservoir, a conventional gas reservoir that pulls gas from sandstones, gets almost 100% recovery, right? It's like 90% almost every time. And suddenly, for the shale gas, we're getting 25% recovery factors. That means for every well that we put down, we're getting 25% of what's in the ground. We're leaving 75% behind. That's, that's completely inefficient, right? So uh, you know, if 
you're like a really, really smart engineer and you want to work on this problem instead of PV, which everyone's doing, this is, a, this is a great problem to solve. And in fact, I had an undergraduate working with me um, on this, and we came up with some really great ways to improve recovery factors. And we're going to have a paper on it and everything. So this is, this is a key problem, right? So across the whole states of the United States, we've got 200,000 wells, and they're completely inefficient. So let's figure this out. This is you know, unacceptable. Huge footprint for not very much resource per well. OK, we've talked a lot. I, I know you've heard probably all day about the need to limit um, CO2 emissions and the um, issue around coal. So the top map shows the um, primary coal production in 2017, I think that was. Um, you know, we see what's happening, right? So why is China exploding with coal right now? Why are they choosing coal? It's full of coal, so it's a local resource. Yes. What else? They're easy to build. Yep. And in fact, we've got 300 gigawatts of coal generation under construction, right? And these coal plants last, what, three decades, something like that. So, and, and it's, I'm sure you've heard statistics like this uh, during the week. So, 38% of global power is from coal. And it's generating 75% of the global power emissions. But really, it's a cost problem, right? We've got to change the economics here. So uh, this is a natural gas brief. This is from um, the program I run. We have a couple of um, really smart economists who are looking at how to do this. And it, it's not rocket science, right? I'm a lowly geophysicist. And even I understand if you stick a price on carbon and tell people they have to pay, and coal is generating 50% more carbon than the equivalent natural of natural gas, right? We put a price on it, and suddenly gas becomes more attractive. And there's some threshold at which that happens. But you know, I think, especially in the, the states, we forget that in other countries, they don't have the luxury of thinking about the environment and trying to do the right thing. They're trying to get energy to people that don't have it, right? We got a billion people on the planet with no energy, and we have another billion and a half with like really unreliable or intermittent energy. And if you think about it, there's no rich countries that don't have energy, right? So in order for economic growth and development and all the luxuries that you and I are afforded at places like Stanford and in the United States and other developing countries, we need energy in order to make that happen. So as you go on your journey at Stanford, I encourage you to step back every once in a while and think about this from a global perspective, right? And you know, we know that the energy demand is only going to continue to increase. We've got huge population uh, growth. In fact, India is going to surpass China in terms of its energy demand over the next 20 years or so. And we have this changing paradigm, right? So the United States, which was an importer, is now an exporter of energy. We have more energy than we know what to do with, like negative numbers. And the Middle East, which was exporting a lot, is now importing. So it's a changing paradigm. And uh, I, I, really, I really think that the global picture is worth stepping back to consider. And in addition to power, right? So, you know, getting light and electricity to people. We have 4 million, 4 million people dying a year, every year, because of indoor air pollution. Because they're having to cook and heat their homes with wood and biomass and all manner of ugly things, right? That's more than AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined, right? And that's, that's unacceptable in a world where we have this abundance of natural gas. My goodness, get these people some propane tanks, right? Seriously, right? And that's, what, that's one of the things that we look at in the Natural Gas Initiative, and I'll kind of touch on this a bit more in a minute. But you know, we've got these like giant solutions, right? So the bottom is a big LNG um, tanker, and, you know, and there's all this infrastructure that goes with it. Well, getting that in place in places like India is a logistical nightmare, right? And it takes a lot of money, and there's supply chain issues. And sometimes, you know, we have to step back and look at these kind of smaller scale solutions. So there's, 
this really neat company that we've been uh, interacting with called Pago. They've come up with this smart meter. You know, it turns out in Africa in particular, a lot of people don't have flushing toilets, but they all have a mobile phone. And so they use, you know, the internet is now global. And they can use that in order to um, buy energy in this kind of format, right? And they have people, consultants that go out to these little rural villages delivering this kind of smart canister. So energy, you know, as you're, as you're thinking about uh, what you're going to work on, and I, I think scale is really important. And sometimes the most immediate solutions are not the huge projects, right? But rather practical on the ground solutions. So, you know, the outlook for energy, uh, I think, you know, we all wish and thought, I think, that this transition to uh, cleaner energy sources would be faster than it has been. But the increase in energy means that, you know, we're going to be reliant on renewables and natural gas for a long time. And again, going back to that, not letting perfect be the enemy of the good, right? If gas is a way to get energy to people in developing countries such that they become economically stable, such that they can start making good decisions about the environment and having less health costs to deal with, then I think that that's uh, you know, a really valuable um, source of energy to, to think about. But we still have, you know, um, carbon dioxide emissions, right? So, so we've got this increasing energy. We do need to think about the um, carbon dioxide emissions. So I want to take a minute to talk about carbon capture and sequestration. So I'm sure many of you are aware. I came out of uh, Chevron, you know, a big um, oil and gas company. There's been this paradigm shift in that business, right? So all of a sudden, right, these big... Uh, corporations are like, oh my gosh, climate change, it's real, right? Public acknowledgement. And with that, they're putting their money where their mouth is with initiatives like this. So this is the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, um, and they're looking, they're collectively putting in fairly large sums of money to find solutions. And carbon capture and storage is an absolutely critical part. It's been you know, demonstrated that in order to achieve the Paris Accords two degree scenario, CCS is absolutely necessary. So this graph shows um, the amount of carbon that you would have to capture and store in order to meet the two degree scenario through time. And it's broken down here into power, industry, and other. Okay, so this is where we're at right now. This is how much carbon we are currently capturing and putting in the ground 30 million tons a year. It doesn't even, it, it's like irrelevant on this chart, right? So this scale is in gigatons and we're talking about million tons, 30 million tons. That's where we're at right now. Pathetic. Okay. This happens to be the equivalent of what global, this should say oil and gas production is, right? So currently, the oil and gas industry is producing about 30 billion barrels a year. So they're sucking out 30 billion barrels of oil and gas from porous rock, for the most part, that you could put carbon dioxide into. Hmm, that's looking good. Like maybe we pull it out and we put stuff in. And here's like twice, right? So in order to get out at 2060, you're looking at sequestering twice the amount of global oil and gas production. And there's been lots of ways that people have looked at this, right? There's like geologic storage in aquifers. But really, the oil and gas reservoirs are the only viable solution. And uh, we've been actively working with a number of, of companies to do just this, right? So they know the subsurface. We don't have to spend years characterizing the rocks. They over, they've already done that for us. And most of the infrastructure is in place. It turns out you can pretty much use the same wells that you pull oil and gas out with to put carbon dioxide in. The pore space is there. The volumes are on the right scale. And it has the potential for real impact. I think this 
idea of scale is, is really important. So I'm, I'm really excited about this. And my hope is that the evil oil and gas industry become the atmospheric services industry that kind of helps us with this huge problem. Because there really aren't other viable ways of uh, capturing CO2 right now and storing it. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my program. And I wanted to, um, as I go through this, kind of give you a feel of what professors are working on what. Um, and uh, and uh, all of this information is on the website, so ngi.stanford.edu, if anyone's interested. And I'm always up for a coffee if you want to just have a chat. Ilman knows. He came and saw me. So, OK, so the Natural Gas Initiative uh, is we have about 40 research groups across campus. So science and engineering, business, economics, policy, even the medical school. And we, um, we uh, work with industry partners. So, so it's an affiliate program. They pay dues. Um, and we fund research projects in many, many different areas related to natural gas. So. Some of our members, I'm sure you'll recognize some of those. So these are the, um, the seven focus areas uh, that we do research in and that we fund research in. We are, this year we added uh, data science and hydrogen. I'll talk a little bit about those. Um, and we are actively growing. So. I, um, one of the things I'd like to do this year is uh, look at renewable gas and how that fits into this picture. So if it's all right with you, I will take you on a quick journey with my gratuitous PowerPoint and, um, and just kind of give you a little flavor of each of these, mostly so that if there's something that tickles your fancy, you know the right people to contact. You can reach out to me and say, hey, I'm super interested in that. All of these um, focus areas have a website on link to NGI with papers and all sorts of cool stuff. So I'll start with methane emissions. So this is Adam Brand and uh, Rob Jackson. And um, I, I kind of talked a lot about the benefits of natural gas. And what I didn't tell you, it's a minor issue, is that we actually have a bit of a problem because methane um, is leaking from a lot of the infrastructure. So about 2% of production, global production of natural gas, leaks into the atmosphere from the wellheads or from the pipes that it's transmitted through. And so this group is actively working on detection methodologies and mitigating uh, ways of um, rendering that a non-issue. So this is a picture from, they did a big field trial. So they took, um, I think, 12 companies and did control pests in the field to look at how good those technologies were at detecting um, the methane leaks. Uh, they just had a paper out on that yesterday. You can find it on our website if you're interested. We have a couple of postdocs who developed a low-cost sensor in the lab and have now been funded from our members uh, to form a company. Uh, so that's full moon. We have a paper coming out on that too. And then we're looking at kind of globally quantifying because nobody has really been able to come up with a baseline of how bad this issue is. So top down estimates and bottoms up estimates don't really match. So this group is working on figuring out exactly how serious an issue methane leaks are. Uh, I talked a little bit about unconventional gas reservoirs. So this would be Mark Zoback and Tony Kopchak. Uh, part of this is around making the, um, the process, the production process more efficient. Um, but there's also some really cool work that Tony's doing on using carbon dioxide as the hydrofracking fluid. So imagine you get more production and you sequester CO2 in the process. Right? So that's the, the basic idea. Uh, energy access. So Mark and I um, work on this. I'm uh, really interested in uh, developing decision analysis tools to help People at a national level make choices in their energy um, uh, sources. Um, I think that there, you know, we talked about the relative cost of gas and coal. If you start including externalities like healthcare, suddenly gas becomes way cheaper. 
right? So if you look at China and what they're spending on healthcare associated with pollution um, related health costs, um, gas, it becomes a much better choice. So I'm interested in kind of quantifying that. And also getting natural gas liquids and propane, we talked about that, out to people so that they don't have to cook over wood and biomass. Uh, methane conversion uh, for the chemists in the room, this is a 40 decade old problem, um, but there's a lot of benefit in being able to convert methane efficiently to methanol. And so we have three faculty members, Tom Jaramillo, uh, Matteo Carnello, and Xiaoling Zheng, uh, working on this from different perspectives. We've just had a couple of papers in Nature uh, that Matteo Carnello uh, wrote around really cool stuff. Uh, natural enzymes are able to do this, and he was able to mimic that in the lab. Um, hydrogen, so 80% of hydrogen right now is generated from natural gas. So there's a link there, but also there is, um, you know, a real decarbonization target would be to use hydrogen in the natural gas pipelines, right? So if we add more hydrogen, it burns very similarly. You can add up to maybe 15, 20%. Um, and so we have a lot of research going on in this space. We just had a big workshop, and we have a white paper coming out soon. Should be out in the next month or so. And that's uh, Zhao Lin Zhang is our faculty leader for that. Uh, global markets and governance. So this is the issue around carbon pricing and looking at how the gas, renewables, and coal electricity markets all work together. Uh, Frank and Mark are actually running a workshop for us um, in... Uh, less than a month, um, where we're going to play a game to look at this. Uh, data science, data science is everywhere. And what we recognized at Stanford, not just NGI, this is kind of much bigger than that, is that subsurface data science is all this technology, and it's not really being integrated and grounded in the physical models. And so we're holding a, it's going to be epic, a workshop. Um, we have uh, technology giants like Microsoft coming in, but also tons of like startups and um, energy companies and uh, consumers to figure out where we need to go in this space. So it's going to be a roundtable discussion. I have space for a few students, so if people are interested, uh, you can let me know. So. The events that I've been talking about are, um, it's what we affectionately call NGI week. It happens in October. Uh, we have three workshops and an affiliates meeting. If you're interested, you can email me. Um, we have information on the website. The agendas are um, up. And we certainly uh, welcome your participation. So with that, I will take any questions that you have. We need mics. I don't know. Can you speak loudly? Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, really great talk. Thank you for chatting with us. Uh, one of my questions was that when you think about energy access, it seems like the trade-off between coal and natural gas is pretty clear. Um, but what about the trade-off between, say, natural gas or like a solar lamp? Um, or is the solar plus storage combination still not at cost parity with natural gas? It's a great question, and it's uh, geographically dependent, right? So we do look at all of those trade-offs, right? I think the, the biggest priority right now is displacing coal. We have to figure that part out. But you're right that we also need to think about how natural gas integrates with renewables. So we are holding a conference in India, for example, to talk about that and to figure out you know, where those um, trade-offs lie. But I, yeah, I think it's a great question. And you know, I don't have any answers, because it, it really does depend on what location you're talking about. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah, thanks for your talk. Um, so throughout the week, we've basically been, um, people have explained to us how carbon capture is often one of the most expensive parts, or negative emissions is one of the most expensive parts. Uh, of this cycle. 
Uh, so my question is, if the if the infrastructure and the knowledge is in place, wh why is this so expensive? And um, yeah, I, I think that's my main question. It's a great question. So you have to transport the emissions basically to the site. That's a big part of it, right? It's you know putting in pipelines is probably the most costly element. Um, if you're looking at already depleted oil and gas reservoirs and the wells are in place, it becomes much more cost effective. So one of the things that I think we need to jump on right now is in places like the shallow Gulf of Mexico and um, the North Sea, there's a whole bunch of fields that are just on decline. Like they're getting ready to start thinking about abandonment. Abandonment for oil and gas companies is super expensive. And so if we can flip it, right, to start injecting um, carbon dioxide and do CCS there, then it becomes actually a positive cost equation for the companies. So I think the numbers that we see are often from scratch. Like if you were to do this from scratch at the source, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a lot of work, right? So these oil and gas reservoirs, they're characterized sometimes for a decade before they're drilled. And that's part of the cost equation that I think people often quote. Sure. And just a follow up question mm -hmm. then. Um, so is there any incentive, though, for them to maintain these places uh, with the labor to, to basically reduce those emissions? Or, I'm sorry, to go negative emissions, because now they're no longer making any money off of that. And while I would hope they have altruistic region, reasons for continuing, I don't think that's no, how so, the world works. So, so I, I, I think in places like the North Sea, where there is carbon pricing, it becomes a better equation for them. And we have, that's our job, right, is to figure out the economic, in fact, Mark will probably talk a little bit about that. Um, We're just playing games. Right? Oh, you're just playing games. So, yeah, but I think, um, you know, figuring out how to make the economics work, right? We can't expect companies to do things if it's gonna lose them money, but if we can be uh, ingenious, right? And suddenly, if they don't have to spend $5 billion abandoning a well, and instead, right, it's a lot cheaper for them to sequester, and they get the good PR, right, and their shareholders are happy, that's a better equation. So part of it is reframing it, right, to make it an economic incentive. But it's a great, it's a great question. Thank you. Yep. Uh, thank you. Um, Professor, I am Shen Chen from China. It's nice to meet you. Yeah, I, uh, as I mentioned before, just now, China is full of coal and the main electricity output is from the coal power plant. However, the Chinese government also wants to uh, make a, a big energy transformation. This is why we all come here. And my question is, uh, since China is full of coal but lack of the natural gas, uh, the Chinese government want to make a energy transformation without damage damage for its uh, economy and the so the national security. Therefore, what's your advice for this kind of situation? Well, you know, I I mean. I understand why they're developing coal, right? We, we all do, right? It's an economic reason. So you actually have a lot of unconventional resources. So one of the things that we've been doing is working with um, Chinese, the Chinese oil companies to help them characterize and develop those resources. So that's one possible option. I think it's all trade-offs. And I think including the externalities into the equation, right? You know, the, the pollution issues alone, right, are, are costing a lot of money. And so when you start kind of looking at this in a more holistic way, I, I think that um, different choices might be made. But, I mean, I, it, it's challenging. We're all, like, trying to figure out paths forward through this challenge. So I can't give you any kind of, um, you know, magic wand advice on that. And one, one last question is the China... Uh, has import many natural gas from R Russia yep. or LNG from Australia, but do you think um, this way uh, is is it still be a safe when um, an emergency happens like uh, politi po uh, political 
something happened? Well, is you it... know, geopolitical concerns are always a risk, right? And I mean, I think the States is really lucky that we have this resource right here because it does give us national security. And I mean, it's a great question. And I think diversifying, you know, your sources is important. Yeah. Okay. Lots to think about. Thank you very much. All right. All right. With that, thank you, yeah, Dr. Bonnes. Uh, we'll come.